This is Teach Play Love. The Bright Horizons Parenting Podcast, just for ages 0 to 8. Get the advice you need from our own early childhood expert, Education Vice President Rachel Robertson. And make the most out of every chance to teach, play, and love. Math is everywhere. We're constantly adding, subtracting, measuring, counting. It's a big part of our everyday life. So it's important to teach our children. But how can we make it so that math is easy to understand and exciting to learn? Rachel and Ruth discuss some simple ways to get your child started with math. Hi there, Ruth. Our topic for today is something that can really elicit strong feelings from adults. There's some that love it, many hate it, but we all need it. Oh my lands, Rachel, that sounds like a riddle. Yeah, I think people certainly feel like it is a big riddle because we're going to talk about math and what kind of mathematical development occurs in the earliest years. What's important, and I promise, easy ways to include math in everyday life experiences. Oh, that's going to be a really useful discussion, but I'm going to guess that some people who are listening are already starting to feel a little bit of math anxiety. Yeah, fair point. So let's start there, in fact, because adult math anxiety can really impact children's confidence and eventual competence in math. Yeah, and nobody really wants to pass math anxiety on to their kids, so it must be happening unconsciously. What can we do to prevent our anxiety being passed on to our children? Well, an adult's math anxiety is passed on in how they react to math and the things they say. I can just hear people I've heard, maybe even myself, saying things like, I'm not good at math, or math makes me really anxious. These statements about math, or anything like them really, can influence a child's perception about the topic. And it seems pretty logical that if they're hearing that a lot, even before they're doing math consciously, that they've developed a fear or at least feel unsure. That's exactly it. And of course, you know, math can be challenging. At an advanced level, it's like a different language, and there is a lot of complexity. But it can also be really interesting and exciting. Learning it with a sense of interest and confidence is so much different than learning it with a sense of, like, foreboding, especially in these real formative years when self-concept is developing. So unless there is a developmental reason, anyone with the right mindset and learning experiences can experience success with math. Okay, so setting your own math anxieties aside and not voicing them to your children is a first step. Maybe rethinking your own feelings about math, if you're someone who doesn't feel positive about it, could be maybe a good side project. Yeah, good suggestion. And I really recommend all of this based on research, but also my own experience. I myself didn't have a lot of success in math as a kid, but I did have a few teachers along the way who showed me that I could succeed with some content in some learning experiences. So then when I got into education myself, I didn't want to be one of those people that was scared of a content area, especially one that I knew was so important. So I started to learn more about it, and now I have a very healthy feeling about math. I don't get it all, and I probably never will, but I'm confident that I could get more of it if I put the effort into it, and that's what we want children to feel like. That's a great example of how mindset and experiences can work together. That's a good takeaway for parents listening. So assuming there is a positive mindset in place, what kind of math are young children really doing? Math is literally everywhere in all of our lives and a big part of early development. Often we're thinking of learning to count as the mathematical's task of the early years, but there's so much more to it. I'd actually really like to stress that point because I know academics is a source of concern for many parents and they're looking for tangible proof, like their child being able to count. You know, counting is an important math skill and it is a way that children can demonstrate the order of numbers. What is most important for children to understand is the bigger concept of numbers and what they stand for. This is different and way more comprehensive than just being able to count from 1 to 10, which is often just a result of memorization, not true understanding. And even when they do understand it, counting is only part of what's needed to fully get the concept of quantity. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Since counting is such an obvious math skill, it gets a lot of focus. Beyond counting, Rachel, what else is part of the bigger concept? It's not as hard as it may sound. When children are learning to count, we should be sure they are really counting items versus just reciting numbers. Ask them questions like, how many plates do we need at the dinner table? How many books should we read tonight? How many shoes are in your closet? Things like that. This builds an understanding of quantity and the idea of what each number stands for and that it's fixed no matter what you're counting. If you're counting shoes, if you're counting books, if you're counting plates, two is two. Something we talk about a lot is one-to-one correspondence, meaning one count or number per item. So if you have five napkins, you get one number per napkin. If you have five children, you have one number per child. Another interesting concept is the cardinality principle, knowing that the last number you count is equal to the quantity. For example, if I do have five napkins and I've counted to five, that actually is the quantity I have. And then order, shape, size, etc., does not impact quantity. That's a lot to learn. That's also really interesting. And it also sounds really sophisticated. When you explain it, I can see how important that all is. But I don't think it's what many of us think of right away when they think of math for young kids. Yeah, I mean, early learning is incredibly sophisticated. The brain is making millions of connections and figuring out how literally everything works. Other early learning mathematical concepts include things like spatial relationships and early geometry, finding and creating patterns, and comparing and contrasting properties. You said it earlier, Rachel, but it is really true that math is everywhere and part of almost everything in the early years. And I think one thing to note is that all of the things you said don't require the kind of lessons I think many envision when they're thinking about math learning. That's very true. Researchers observing young children find that they just do a lot of math through regular play. In play, they're exploring math concepts and they're solving problems all of the time. They are motivated and the outcomes and the solutions are relevant when they're doing math through play. But this doesn't mean math lessons themselves aren't valuable. Play and lessons aren't mutually exclusive, but, you know, when there is a math lesson, it shouldn't be a memorization activity. Math lessons should introduce or allow for practice of a concept that can be applied in play. Okay, that's great, but give us a few examples. So first examples of ineffective activities are things that can be memorized, like counting in order over and over, or flashcards that are all about memorization. A much better alternative is something like offering experiences and an environment filled with natural opportunities to experiment with and use math. And adults that are around can interject math vocabulary or simply ask questions that require mathematical reasoning. Okay, tell us more about the environments and experiences that families can create. So just starting off with the simple things that you probably already have a lot of, like puzzles or simple blocks with different shapes and sizes, these two items alone build early understanding of spatial relationships and geometry principles. Try adding rulers and measuring sticks or tape to play spaces. Include a lot of loose parts, and that means materials that can be used for a lot of purposes, like stones or shells or pom-poms. Of course, always thinking about safety and choking hazards for young children. Think about different size containers. You want children to be able to compare and contrast, to experiment with size and volume, to put things in order or a sequence, to find and create patterns. And imaginary free play is a wonderful way to apply all sorts of math. I'm not sure that connection is really obvious, Rachel. Tell us more about that. If they want to play shoe store, great. Let them measure feet and organize shoes by size. If they want to create a fort, give them paper and pencil to sketch blueprints and different materials to fit together. Yeah, that sounds like pretty typical fun for a young child, and it's really interesting to consider from a mathematical perspective. So how about math vocabulary? Earlier you said adults can use math vocabulary. I have a feeling that it's more than numbers, but it would be great if you could talk a little bit more about that. Words like more, less, under, over, after, before, long, short. 
those are all representative of mathematical concepts and are, of course, they're really easy to just throw in everyday conversation. Like, look, Su Lin has more red blocks than I do, and Jacob has fewer green blocks than Elijah. Also, using ordinal numbers like first, second, or third, numbers that tell you where something is in order or sequence are also useful. Okay, now I see how easy that would be. I think about the cooking that I do with my grandchildren. There's a lot of natural math vocabulary when you're cooking with kids. There are so many measurement opportunities, discussions about quantity, volume, amount. Yeah, Rachel, you know I'm I'm a quilter and I quilt with my grandkids. And we have so many just natural discussions about fitting triangles and squares together and how we can make triangles out of squares. And we measure everything. Yeah, that's a great example. Another easy one is comparing and contrasting items on something as simple as a nature walk. I see three tall trees and one short tree. What do you see? Or working on a family puzzle or board games that use math skills, like good old classics like shoots and ladders or mastermind or sorry. Or play some guessing games about quantity. Actually, that's how my dad used to keep us busy at restaurants when we were kids. He would say, guess how many sugar packets there are, how many toothpicks, how many servers are wearing white shoes versus black shoes, really just about anything. Think about how rich those learning experiences are compared to doing repetitive math flashcards that only teach a child what word and number go together. Yeah, I bet everybody's minds are just swimming with ideas about math activities now with kids. I love that your dad did those estimation games at restaurants. One last thing I want to ask you to expand on is say more about mathematical reasoning. You mentioned this earlier as something an adult can do, but can you start by telling us what you mean and then giving us some examples of how a parent can help a child develop those skills? Okay, here's where you get to feel really high level and sophisticated. Mathematical reasoning is thinking about a problem using reason in a mathematical way. We all do this without thinking about it. When we think about how much time it will take to drive a distance, or which container size we need for leftovers, or how much we can afford to spend on dinner out. This leads to a really important skill called the ability to subitize. And this is the ability to know or closely guess quantity by just looking at something. Like I can look at my desk right now and know that I have two pens without counting them. I have three keys on my key ring. Didn't have to count those. So I'm subitizing. Make predictions, gather data, and make decisions based on the data. Like maybe you could graph every family member's favorite fruit. Solve math problems together. Things like Hey kids, we have five cookies and three kids. How are we going to evenly share the cookies? Of course, young children aren't always going to get this right, and maybe they're going to think they personally should have all the cookies. But the opportunity to think it through will show you what they know, and you will be modeling reasoning skills to help them learn. Can we do this with infants and toddlers? Is it relevant to them at all? Yeah, it sure is. They're not going to have a chance at solving the cookie conundrum, of course, but they can understand concepts like more or less, now or later, and they can start working on shapes, patterns, and spatial relationships. It seems so obvious when we talk it through, Rachel, but we both know that many school districts or private schools do kindergarten readiness assessments or entrance testing, and parents worry about proving their own child's proficiency. That is an important question you raise. The readiness assessments aren't meant to inspire a lot of boring memorization lessons, but they often do. A really good thing to keep in mind is that what's on the assessment should be an outcome of rich learning experiences, not the only goal of learning. Parents should feel really reassured that when they infuse math into daily activities that are so much more meaningful, children will learn all they need to know to get ready for kindergarten and more. Their child will not just learn content, but they'll be able to apply it, and they'll be excited about learning. They'll get rid of all that math anxiety and look forward to it. So yes, their child will know how to count to 10, not because they memorized it, but because they understand the basic ideas of quantity. I'm going to share something that I find really interesting. Research in the last few years has led us to a new and important understanding about early math. When children have a strong foundational sense of math, it actually predicts stronger long-term outcomes in math and literacy. That's surprising. Researchers have a lot of theories about why this is true, but nothing definitive yet. 
Also, I find interesting, the converse is not true. Early literacy does not predict or correlate with math. This doesn't mean early literacy isn't important. It definitely is. But it tells us that math should not take a back seat to literacy. But parents don't have to choose. Reading books with math principles, building vocabulary through back and forth dialogue, imaginary play that includes development in both areas, it can all happen at once. Well, I'm totally back to being impressed with how sophisticated all this is. Yeah, sophisticated and really easy because it's important for young children to have math in their early lives. Those little learners deserve our respect for all that they're learning and developing in the first years. And I hope that everyone listening is walking away feeling much more comfortable with math in the early years and knowing how they can have fun while fully supporting their child's mathematical development. Counting stones, identifying shapes, building forts, measuring ingredients for cooking, these are all ways children are using math naturally. It's different from just memorizing with flashcards. And when you see math in that natural way and apply it to everyday experiences, it can feel much easier to understand. So as Rachel says, infuse math into daily activities. That alone can build a strong foundation for life. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to us and find more episodes on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time on Teach, Play, Love and rediscover parenting as the joy it was meant to be.